All right, so today I'm going to be talking about this mystical params variable, which is, as all of you uh, Rails developers know, is randomly a defined method or maybe variable in every single Rails controller you write without you ever having to define it. And I think that's cool. So a little bit about myself for the, like, six of you that already know me, don't feel free not to listen. Uh, I work for Springbuck. Uh, I am a software engineer. I really like doing Ruby things. Uh, there's my GitHub if you want to see a bunch of uh, projects that I've started and not finished. Uh, but really, I have just a, like a very really deep down curiosity for Rails driven by the fact that I never had formal software training. And so a lot of the like really like complex server side code stuff that Rails abstracts away from having to know is really, really interesting to me. And I am always curious to learn more about it. And that's what brought me onto the params variable because of Ruby magic. So I'm gonna go briefly back to when I was first learning Ruby on Rails. Uh, I, I picked up Ruby fairly quickly because Ruby is a super expressive and easy to learn language. Uh, it, there's a bajillion way to do things, so it's very hard to do it wrong. And it's just soup and it's, it was my first ever interpreted language, which was a sweet relief from having to compile code. Rails, on the other hand, is not easy. And the reason for that is that it just does a whole lot for you, which is a double-edged sword because it, on the one hand, it keeps you from having to learn all those, like how to set up connections and how to interface with database. But on the other hand, you, you feel like you should be know, know what's, ha what's happening and you just don't. And so that was the problem that always got in the way of me really enjoying learning Rails is that I just didn't know what I didn't know and that really bothered me. And that's what brings me to the params variable. I, if you look on like basically any Ruby on Rails tutorial and you build a controller, it's going to talk about the params variable and tell you what it is briefly, but then just say, all right, that's all you need to know, just use it. And that's like really lame. Like, so we're gonna, I'm going to tackle what it actually is by trying to answer two questions. Where does it come from? And uh, I, looking at my presenter notes, that's not my slide's not here. I made the, I made this talk in like two hours, so get cut me some slack. Uh, and what what does it do and where does it come from? So I built a very basic contrived example of a controller here, and it's obviously super easy, but we have this pesky little params variable here despite me not defining it anywhere in my controller. So to start out with like, trying to figure out where that is or what that is and where it comes from, let's just ask the question, what is it? Now, if you t talk about just basic intuition looking at this controller, you can be like, all right, so it probably c contains some sort of parameters involving posts, and it probably has something to do with it probably has some sort of structure that allows me to require a post and then permit other things. So it, it makes sense, but it doesn't really tell you anything about it. So to investigate this, I built a really boring controller. Literally all it does is you uh, call it and it activates a breakpoint for me to investigate in my Rails server. And I curl it and it brings up the breakpoint and I look at params and I can tell immediately from the terminal output that it is an instance of the action controller params class. Uh, it, it has a hash that contains uh, a, like what controller we're calling and the action that it's calling. And it has something, it has a, some, some sort of permitted flag. Although, disclaimer, that's only for Rails 5. In Rails 4, if you were just to call params, it would just give you a hash. But if you do, if you look at the, it's still an instance of action controller parameters. So it's still, like, you'll still have all the same functionality. It just won't look the same. 
So it, it, it does a lot of things. It obviously can determine the controller and the action. It can also accept arguments. In this case, I tacked on the test data arguments to the URL, and you can, it showed up in the hash. So it can apparently parse URLs to determine not only the controller in action, but also data in the URL. You can also kind of pass it a form type object, and it will figure out what's inside that. Although one small difference is that it nests it inside of a form key in this case. And of course, I can also pass it JSON. I have to I have to tell it what type what the con type of content to look for so that it can parse it correctly. But again, it interprets it and includes it in that hash. Although it's in interestingly, it actually merges it in twice. It merges it in once the top level, right here, and it merges it in again in a nested uh, nested inside of a blank endpoint key, which. In this, which in this case matches up to the controller endpoint. So there's some magic. Uh, and then just to show you some of the things I can do with it, given a instance of it where I pass it JSON and it parses it into the, uh, it parses it, we have the params variable available in the controller. I can call require on it right here. And it returns another instance of the parameters with a changed hash. Additionally, if I call to hash on that on the variable, it blows up and tells me you can't do that. Specifically with an unfiltered parameters error. So you can require and permit, but if you try to treat it like a hash, or if you try to convert it directly to a hash, it doesn't it just like tells you a hard no and then kicks you out. Uh, but however, you can turn it into a hash if you uh, change that permit flag that I mentioned earlier. And one way to do that is just by calling permit bang on it, and it modifies the object to allow you to access the access it as a hash. So all this is a, the uh, after a little bit of digging, I was able to figure out where this all this stuff is defined. Um, for those of you that didn't know, which of course everyone here probably does because you're all pretty experienced, but the Rails project is on GitHub, and I've listed the file path to see where these, where all this stuff is defined. And I also included a. Can you not hear me? Quit. Do you need a raise? No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, it, it's a. Uh, 600 line roughly Ruby file. It does some really awesome stuff. So if you want to like see some cool Ruby in action, I highly recommend checking it out. And it's also incredibly well documented. For every method in that file, there is a solid like five to ten lines of doc of comments documenting what it actually does. So the Rails team clearly felt very strongly about this change. And I pulled out just one uh, example here of some of their documentation. Uh, it's probably too small to see from far away, but the gist of it is that it tells you that it prevent, this object prevents you from accidentally exposing data that you don't want to to the client and also publishing it to the database. And the simple fact that they would bother explaining why they implemented such a large, like a small yet large feature tells you how careful, how much they care about it. And so you may be like Michael Bluth and be wondering, like, all right, can you, like, can you just summarize it? And the gist of it is, before Rails four, uh, they, the params variable essentially existed, uh, existed as well, but it wasn't as flushed out. And so what people would do is they would just call create on a instance of a model with whatever the user sent them. And so if the user sent them a, post, a request they didn't expect, then it would blow up and their controllers would, you know, not, like they, they would have all sorts of problems. And even worse, it opened them up to exposing data to clients and causing like 
open it up to attacks. And so what this what the params feature does is it forces developers to use good practices in Linux controllers. So returning back to this question, what is params? It's essentially just a really fancy hash that allows the user to uh, be more exclusive about what the controller actually uses. I'm going to give a really quick brief overview of some of the features. Uh, this is the initialization method. Uh, or I'm sorry, this is actually the strong parameters module, uh, which extends the action controller module, which all of your controllers should inherit, inherit from action controller, which means that this module will be included in your controller. And notice it has this little defined method params, which just returns an instance of parameters. And that's why the params variable is, which is actually a method and it's defined in all of your controllers because they're inheriting it from Action Controller. And just to prove it, I went back to that old endpoint earlier and then just looked at the ancestors of the controller we were in and checked it for Action Controller strong parameters, and it is, and it's defined. So whenever you access params, you're actually accessing Action Controller strong parameters. Uh, here's the initialization of the parameters class. Uh, two things to notice, it delegates a lot of methods to the parameters instance variable. And that's just to kind of give your parameters class a lot of the hash functionality out of the box. Uh, additionally, it accepts, it ex has an optional, parameter, opti optional initialization parameter called parameters uh, that is immediately called with indifferent access. And that's a cool method I didn't even know existed, but it essentially allows you to access the hash keys by passing either a string or a, a symbol. And it works the same way either way. And then it also hard codes the permitted instance variable to the this permit all parameters function class method, which is uh, defined to be by default false. So it's, when you first initialize it, it's going to like not allow you to reveal stuff. Uh, here's the permit method. The gist of what it does is it inst instantiates a new instance of the parameters class, loops over all the filters you pass it, and then checks to see if they are exist in the first place. And if it doesn't, then it just kind of ignores it from what I can tell. I actually didn't look that deeply into what's happening beyond this method. But then it calls per permit bang on the the new instance of parameters so that it's access accessible immediately. And that's how you can call permit and then immediately pass it to the database. Uh, in case you're curious, there's this permit scalar filters. This is what it does. It just looks to see if the key exists and then if it's permitted, and then adds it to the new instance array, or new instance hash. So that's neat. Now let's talk about where it comes from. We kind of already answered this a little bit because we just showed you the, the module where it's defined. So we already know it's, it comes from uh, Action Controller. But let's dig a little bit deeper because when we look at that Action Controller, it uses this random request variable and then calls parameters on it. And that's where the data actually comes from. So let's have a quick conversation about what happens when computers chat. Uh, I have given the subtitle uh, a model of terse and effective communication because this is how I wish all of my conversations went. <laughs> uh, you know, each person knows exactly what the other is going to like the general gist of what they're going to say, and they have defined functions for what they're going to say based on what the user passes them. And if the, if, the, if the client or the person you're speaking to deviates from that script, then you can immediately just throw up a 400 error and tell them they're wrong. <laughs> so I, I really wish I could have conversations like that. But it, of course, that's not how humans work. So when computers chat, the browser requests data from the server. The server makes sure that the data looks fine and passes the application. The application takes that data, does a thing, and then returns it back to the server. 
which then formats it with a status code and then sends it back to the client. It's like HTTP protocol or yeah, HTTP 101. But there's a lot of, if you kind of think about it, there's a lot of stuff in there that's like not really defined. The whole, app, the whole application doing its thing is the code that you write. Uh, the client sending and receiving data is all handled by you know, the invisible pipes that uh, everyone set up to transfer stuff across the internet. But what about the stuff, what about the stuff in the middle? The things where the server receives the request and forwards it to your application. And that's where middleware comes in. And when I think of Rails magic, a lot of what I consider to be magic is actually the middleware of Rails. A uh, quick definition of middleware is just the thing that sits in between the application and the client. So it's what receives the request, looks at it, decides what to do with it, and then passes it on to the application. And this is like one of the like big things that Rails was did, did really well, is it removed all of the crappy designing your own middleware stuff that I hear people had to do at one point. Uh, it handled, among other things, it handles receiving and parsing the request. Uh, it handles deciding where to forward it. Uh, it handles, you know, caching and cookies and, and interpreting all that stuff, as well as authentication. And one of, and the thing that kind of drives all this middleware is the application called Rack. And Rack is actually pretty simple. It's just the library that uh, kind of breaks your app application apart from the HTTP stuff. So it's the, it's the thing that listens for the request and then forwards it onto your application, then receives the response back from the application and forwards it to the client. Uh, the gist of what it is is it sits on top of Ruby's net HTTP library and it provides a super, super simple interface with your application. In fact, these are literally all the rules that you have to know when designing an application to sit on top of Rack. And this is straight from the Rack documents. Uh, your application needs to be an object that responds to a call method, receives an environment hash, and returns an array with an HTTP, HTTP response code, a hash of headers, and then the body, which must respond to each. So that's like super, super simple and takes all the pain out of having to design your own protocols. And it, I mentioned the environment hash, and that's like, that, that's, that's the only thing that your application receives from Rack. And here's kind of an example of what it looks like. There's a lot of like bullshit in here that we don't really need to worry about. The important stuff for this talk in particular is the stuff I've highlighted in red. Uh, you have the, re the request parameters, so it has the method and it has the path. So that's like the URL and what, ver what uh, rest verb we're using. And then it has the query string down below, which is just kind of, it's just the body of the request that we're sending, forwarding onto the application. So now what does Rails do with all that? When we talk about Rails, what we're really talking about is, one, a way of designing web applications. So convention over, over customization? Convention over whatever, it's not important. Configuration, Configuration thank you. Uh, but it's also a whole stack of middleware that receives the rack environment variable and then figures out what to do with it. And specifically, what does most of the work is this library called Action Pack. And I highly recommend you lo looking into it into on the GitHub repo if you're at all curious. There's a lot of really cool stuff and it's it's a beast, so it's very hard to navigate. So only do it if you have like several hours and a like a drink to get you through some of the pain. In particular, uh, the part the part that deals with uh, actually receiving the environment variable and forwarding on the controller is called action dispatch, and the gist of what it does is it just takes in the environment variable, throws away all the stuff we don't care about, and returns that hash that we saw in the the parameters uh, or in the in our Rails in our Rails controller. So it has the controller the method and as well as the 
uh, was like the arguments for the actual controller. So we're going to have a quick walkthrough of what happens. And this is way too small to see from back there. I apologize. So Rack, Rack receives the request. It merges the, the request into the environment hash, which is that query string that I mentioned earlier. So all, all the, everything else is pretty much defined uh, like in, based on the environment variables of the server. And then it merges the request parameter as well as the query string into the environment variable. It passes it to action, action dispatch via that call method. So action dispatch has a method defined call, which is the entry point for all the Rails you crap. It parses the environment variable hash. The environment hash, it determines what controller and action to, to use based on that, um, the URL as well as the verb. It passes the request parameters onto the proper controller. And that's actually the end of this. And that gets us, gets us up to that params variable. So returning back to what is params, it's a modified version of Rack's EMV hash that strips away the stuff that Rail doesn't care about and adds some extra functionality. And where does it come from? It just comes from Rack. And Action Dispatch does some cool stuff to parse it and, and put it in a put it in an object that's ready to be used by your controllers. And so that's all. So have a picture of, or have a gif of Job. Or put that, I, that makes me sad. I missed my rest of the development record. But thanks. <laughs> Melees. Um, I'd say probably one of the biggest things that I learned from it is that it's really intimidating to dive into the Rails source code, but it taught me that it's it's doable. Like it's it's just Ruby, despite the despite like how intimidating and huge it is. Like as long as you know like where to start, you can probably if you know how to navigate a Rails app, you can navigate the Rails repo. And I mean, there was also like, I learned an awful, I, I never looked into Rack. I just like always like, yeah, Rails the Rack application. That's all I knew. And I learned a whole lot more about what Rack actually is, which was pretty valuable. I don't, I don't think I could like, you know, replace Rack, but I know what it is and what it does. And I know enough to appreciate it. For what? Probably just the 400 because it tells the user they're wrong but doesn't tell them why. <laughs> Um, it's mostly just once I like got comfortable writing Rails controllers, I would always like I used the param I used params like in every controller that I write, and I was like I just always just took it for granted. And I was just kind of wanted to know where it came from and what it was, and so it's more just like blind curiosity based off because of something I used every single time I would write a controller. It, it feels wrong to like use something so frequently yet, yet know nothing about it. I definitely had a I definitely had a joke can where I was gonna be like, just imagine if you could throw a uh, 
unauthorized status code anytime someone asks you a personal question. Yeah, that's why I didn't say it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if you if you, if, you, if you really prefer configuration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Nice to be done, Steve. Thank you.